In preparation for that Russian-backed government offensive on Idlib, some residents are building makeshift shelters in case they need to take refuge from the bombings again. We were at home when an army helicopter came from the east. The whole family of 11 people went to the shelter. They fired a barrel bomb on the building which completely collapsed. Today we are rebuilding the house and we are preparing the shelter for the next offensive. May God protect us. We stayed in this cave for 10 days to shelter from planes and shelling. We couldn't go to school because friends were wounded or were killed. With me now in studio is Dr. Chai Eitan Cohen Yanarochak, a Turkey analyst at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. Thank you very much, Dr. Yanarochak, for joining us. And we're also joined from London by Alexander Nekrasov, a former Kremlin advisor. Thank you as well, Alexander, uh, for being with us tonight for this discussion. And Dr. Yanarochak, I want to begin with you. Uh, we know Erdogan had said just recently he wants a ceasefire in Idlib, a peaceful solution. That didn't seem to bear much fruit with the Russian uh, president and holding the offensive. Can we count on what they said today, the demilitarized zone? Maybe this will change what everybody said is the mm -hmm. certain fate of Idlib, a bloody war. Well, uh, we should concentrate uh, on the Turkish press. Uh, Mr. Erdogan is selling it as a victory at home, and uh, everyone is talking that Erdogan got what he wanted from this uh, particular summit. And uh, this will I mean, I, I may rename this as an incomplete victory. Why am I saying it an incomplete victory? Because of the fact that the Turkish army now uh, should face a new challenge. They have to collect all this uh, uh, heavy weaponry from the Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, and uh, they would also uh, have to cooperate with uh, Jabhat al-Wataniya al-Tahrir, uh, different groups that Turkey is cooperating with them, but unfortunately, I mean, from the Turkish point of view, they are not having any control over Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. And it's a huge question mark whether the Turks will be able to fulfill uh, their part of uh, in, this, uh, in this agreement. So we're going to see, uh, but if the Russians will not be satisfied from, uh, from the Turkey's part, so then we're going to see if this is a failure or if this is a victory for the Turkish side. We're going to see it. And indeed, uh, Russia's uh, satisfaction is crucial here. Yeah. Let's bring in Alexander Nekrasov joining us uh, from London. Alexander, I hope you could hear our conversation here in studio. Uh, Dr. Yanorachak was telling us that at least uh, as far as the Turkish media is concerned, Erdogan, the Turkish president, got what he wanted out of this uh, summit with the Russian president. Does the Kremlin see it that way? Well, uh, I think it was a breakthrough in a sense because nobody expected that the uh, attack on Idlib will be halted. I, I think in Damascus they're not very happy about it. I don't think they have been consulted before that agreement was reached and uh, details were worked out. But that's how it is. Turkey and Russia are now the main players in this particular operation. They decide how they will proceed. Now, I, I, I agree with the point that Turkey got what it wanted, but how long will it last, this plan? You know, we had so many plans, we had so many proposals, we had so many demilitarized zones and, and so on and so on and so on, and then something would collapse, and then some other uh, outsider would interfere. Uh, the Americans, how are they going to look at it? Uh, hopefully, uh, the, the other parties will be also complying. But uh, I agree with the esteemed colleague that um, it's very difficult to control these groups. Uh, there are so many of them. There are tens of thousands, basically, of fighters. And what if one of these groups decides to break the agreement? And uh, I think Turkey actually has a very, very uh, complicated role there, but the Russians as well. Uh, I mean, it remains to be seen whether this holds. And speaking of Turkey's uh, complicated role in Syria, Dr. Yanarachak, we know uh, it has uh, Turkey that is some very different interests in Syria than uh, Russia does. Can they be reconciled? Can these two powers really work together and bring an end to the Russia, conflict in Russia Israel? and Turkey? Yes. Well, uh, it's a good question. If Turkey uh, can persuade uh, the Russians that Afrin Canton and Jarabus Canton will be recognized as Turkey's uh, influence zones, and nowadays Turkey is trying to add Idlib 
as an additional third province, a third Turkish province inside inside the Syrian territory. So we may we may say yes, but again, uh, we should see if Turks will be able to fulfill their part in this uh, agreement. And according to the results, uh, we may uh, rethink uh, whether uh, Turks will be able to persuade the Russians or not. But from my perspective, it is very much doable. Let me remind you, uh, the Turks have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 12, uh, uh, 12 outposts uh, uh, in, the, in the Idlib uh, province. And they are already there, so they are always reinforcing their powers, they are sending new troops, they are deploying um, even heavy weaponry uh, to the region. So from the Turkish uh, perspective, they are just trying to have Idlib as, uh, as a huge population center uh, for their own people. I mean, not for the Turkish people, but for their own uh, supported uh, entities like the Free Syrian Army. Because at the end of the day, after the end of this uh, civil war, Turkey needs to give these people something very much concrete. Because if Turkey will fail to do so, then it will have a huge headache in its own territories. So now, Turkey is trying to organize and arrange uh, a new second Syria inside Syria, which will be very much loyal to it. And when we are looking at Afrin and Jorablus cantons, we can say that uh, these two cantons are already uh, integrated into the Turkish economy. Uh, the Turkish uh, health ministry, education ministry uh, are uh, working there. They established um, hospitals, they established schools, police fighters, firefighters. Uh, all the equipments, all the food, all the electricity, all the bank system, they are very much integrated uh, into uh, the Turkish uh, economy. And also Turkey nowadays are building highways inside these uh, provinces in order to have a more access and in order to integrate these provinces into the Turkish economy. So Turks, as far as I understand, are, uh, they are here to stay. And now they are also trying to get Idlib and uh, to become, uh, to, to have it adjacent province to uh, Jarablus and Afrin. Of course, they are uh, located next to Alexandretta of Hatay. So uh, at the moment, the, these powers involved in Syria are already looking at the long-term effects of their of presence course. there. Indeed. And I want to, with you, explore maybe Russia's uh, long-term plans there. And let's bring into our conversation uh, Matthew Brodsky. He's a senior fellow at the Security Studies Group in Washington, D.C. He joins us again, a frequent guest uh, on I-24 News. And uh, Matthew, uh, maybe you heard part of our uh, discussion here in studio. We had uh, began to discuss Turkey's long-term plans in Syria, but a of course, if anyone has very interesting long-term plans in Syria, that's, that's Moscow, and they are, in a way, mysterious. Right. Yeah, I think there, everyone has a competing interest right now that's involved inside of Syria. And from Russia's standpoint, one of the greatest things that it can do long-term to serve its own interests is to break Turkey away from NATO and to effectively do anything it can that would affect NATO. So this is a big picture item that Moscow sees. So in the meantime, what it, want, what it, what it decided is that it's better to come to an agreement with Turkey over Idlib now so that Turkey can remain inside of this somewhat coalition that it has currently, which is Turkey and Russia and Iran, who created these de-escalation zones and agreement. Now, the limits to that are, of course, that Turkey at the same time really does not want to see the Kurds have any kind of autonomy or a strengthened presence along its border. So Turkey is still aligned against the United States and its Syrian democratic forces in uh, northeastern Syria or wherever they happen to be located at any moment in Syria. So Turkey is trying to play both sides. Russia is basically accepting less than it would like with this deal inside of Idlib, um, but it is able to then keep Turkey inside of its coalition for now. Moscow also has another way that it's looking at this, and that is, at the same time, it's trying to portray Syria as a stable place so that we should all begin to allow the international community to start uh, sending in billions of dollars for Syria's reconstruction. That money, of course, will be abused by Assad and will be used to make uh, Moscow rich <clears throat> and to make Iran rich, both of whom are 
fairly bankrupt countries financially, but who did the heavy lifting militarily to keep Assad in power. So there's multiple levels to this going on. I think how we got to this moment right here in this negotiation is in large part a result of the strategic shift in U.S. policy towards Syria. A lot of that has to do with uh, Jim or James Jeffrey uh, ambassador being appointed as our Syrian envoy now, who had visited Turkey and Jordan. And uh, you can see also with I-24's own reporting from Nina Larson on this uh, small Syria group, which is designed to look at reconstruction funds and to deny Assad, Russia, and Iran those types of funds. It's part of a larger U.S. effort that is now using its leverage to work toward a better future and a political political process in Syria. So there's many, many items at play here. Work towards a better future in Syria. It seems like a goal that we've been discussing for seven and a half years at least. And uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to solve it tonight. Uh, Matthew Brodsky uh, in Washington, D.C. and Alexander Nekrasov in London. And here with me in studio, Dr. Chai Eitan Koenya Narachak. Thank you all very much you. for joining me for this.